Good morning. Good morning. Well, the church is uh, a bit empty this morning. After the last Sunday, the church was packed. So it's kind of a it's kind of a Russian roller coaster. But uh, it is good to see you. Thank you for coming. You know, your presence here is a blessing to this church, and it is a blessing to this ministry, and Therefore, I thank you. Many people couldn't come for different reasons. Even Lily isn't here, as you must have noticed by now. So, but we do have visitors. So I salute you all, and I salute our visitors this morning. After the service, we'll have coffee time. We can get to know each other a little bit better. But thank you, and God bless you. I have a few announcements to make. And... Uh, First of all, we have found a big sum of money. Isn't that great? But it doesn't belong to us. It belongs to someone who must have lost it in front of the church, perhaps as the person was getting in. This money is now with Ina. If you realize that you lost this big sum of uh, cash, please... Uh, Talk to Ina afterwards. Ina, shake your hands. Yeah, perhaps it's yours. If it's not, it's going to be uh, given to our treasurer for to be used to, to our missions, to our mission funds. Now, we have uh, some coming activities, as you know. You have received uh, the, the newsletter that speaks about them, particularly we have this April, the uh, yard cleanup. And if you're not receiving our newsletter, please let me know and we'll include your email. It serves us as in the past, we had a, a bulletin, most churches used it. Now we have this electronic digital news, newsletter which is sent every Thursday, but uh, we, did, we do have some printouts. So you're not used to computers, you prefer to read it, you, you prefer paper, um, just come and pick up with me uh, the printouts of the newsletter that was sent Thursday, okay? Do not forget to read it uh, either way. And among the things that were informed there, you know that um, there's an action team that is, uh, meeting regularly, and the next meeting is Thursday 27 at 3 p.m. Um, our springtime yard cleanup is going to be on April 29, Saturday, and uh, you are invited to volunteer if you want. And of course, something that uh, might sadden you a bit, but it makes me very glad, Lily and I, we are leaving on a, on a one-month vacation in May, uh, and uh, we'll be traveling, but we'll be back in June. It's just for a month, and, uh, and that means that I'll be here for three more Sundays. But that, as it is informed, our dear friend and brother in Christ, Chris Rigno. Please shake your hand, Chris. He is every Sunday here with us, and he is going to, he has been a pastor in the past for many, many years, uh, and uh, he's a very good preacher, and he's going to uh, do puppet supply for the month of May, and, uh, and of course, Ian, you know Ian, Reverend Ian McPhee, he's going to be in charge of any emergencies. January 
Dot chat. <laughs> June the 1st, I'm back here in my post to continue the ministry. Meanwhile, I'm always ready to, um, uh, to talk to you on the phone if you really need it, okay, throughout the vacation. Besides that, um, we have a special announcement now, and uh, I'll let uh, Shana talk to you about it. Good morning. I'm pleased to inform you that the plant exchange is going to be back this year, and it's going to be held on Saturday, May the 13th, and we want you to bring a plant, take a plant, or you can do both. Also added to this event is going to be a cookie bake sale. So we're looking for some volunteers to bake us some cookies to sell at that event also. And Bruce Davey has volunteered to run a Hamburg barbecue that day too. So please come out and support us and let me know if you can bake any cookies. Thank you. Thank you, Shana. I want to uh, let you know that um, we are all uh, called upon to pray for Brenda and Gil Stewart and their family. Gil is battling cancer, as you know, and he's not doing well. And we uh, let's let's pray that the Lord bless them with peace and comfort and. Uh, the healing that he may bring. That being said, I invite you now to put all your, all your concerns apart, aside, and concentrate. Breathe deeply, and now feel the presence of God, because God is omnipresent, and he is here, and we will worship him and seek communion with God now. We'll start with a song of praise, a gathering song, Living Hope.
Our call to worship is from Psalm 19, and we'll read responsibly verses 1 to 6. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chambers, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, we praise your name for who you are, majestic, wise, all-powerful, a good God, God of love. You have shown us your sacrificial love, your agape love in Christ Jesus, the Son who blessed us infinitely by redemption and reconciliation, living within us now that we may be your people and properly bring renewal to this world. We thank you, Lord, and we ask your anointing. May your Holy Spirit be with us now, leading us on in ministry, inspiring us, illuminating us, giving us the sensitivity that we need to perceive your presence in the works of your hands, in the face of every person created in your own image, that we may see you acting upon us with power, changing us, making us better persons. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you and we praise your name now and forever. Amen. Let us sing once again the praises of the Lord.
You may be seated. We are going to read again from Scripture, now from the book of the prophet Isaiah, as we prepare ourselves for a moment of silent prayer and confession of sinfulness before our good God who forgives us. Isaiah chapter 55. Let's read responsibly. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, says the Lord, my faithful love which was promised to David. Surely you will summon nations you know not and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I send it. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper, and instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. Let us pray in silence now. We seek you now, Father. We seek you with ardent desire to confess that we are sinners who live in a sinful world, that we have not lived perfect lives, much to the contrary. We have been wicked in many ways, selfish, self-centered, there is lack of love in us, and we do not follow your ways as we should, even though we know that your will is good and, and perfect and pleasant. Sometimes we do not seek you in prayer. We are slow to learn and slow to attend to your word, and we ask your forgiveness. We know, Lord, that you are so gracious, always ready to forgive because we know your revelation to us in Christ Jesus, though our advocate, 
the one in whom we can have communion with you, the only mediator. Thank you, thank you, God, for giving us this salvation and this reconnection in Christ. May he abide powerfully in us. May our spirit lead us into holiness, into the sacred, that we may be in the fullness of your spirit, that we may be useful to you, that we may be an example to the nations and be satisfied with the real food, the spiritual nourishment that you provide. Thank you, Lord. In Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let me assure you that God is love that God is forgiving, that God wants what's best for you. And that we know because this is Christ's testimony to us and, and therefore we are happy. So in Christ you are forgiven. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, now it's children's time and I want to talk to you kids about uh, the incredible joy that I find in nature throughout my life. Do you like nature? I don't know if you do or not. You can be honest with me. So let's see, let's see some glimpses of God's creation. When we look at the flowers, we notice God's beauty. It's just a glimpse, actually. We know of God's majesty because he, according to scripture, he is the creator of all things and his being is revealed in the flowers, which are so colorful. What's your favorite flower, Annalise? Hallelujah. What? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Calla lily. Okay, what do you know? I know cauliflower, but not calla lily. But I'm, look, I'm going to look at it. Um, what about you, Benjamin? You don't know. You don't have a favorite flower. I don't have a favorite flower as well, as well because they're so beautiful. Perhaps it should be a lily, huh? Because of lilia. Lilia means lily. Yeah, go ahead, Benjamin. Then the lion. <laughs> yeah, some people think it's a weed. Can you believe it? But then the lions are so pretty and they're fun too to blow, huh? I like to do that. These are tulips, but the, you see so many colors and formats, and we can see the God's glory. That's how you see God's glory, contemplating the geometry present in God's creation. Sometimes we forget how beautiful the animals are. I like bunnies. Do you like bunnies? You all like bunnies, huh? Ah, okay. And what about dogs? When we, when we see a dog, we see how beautiful God's creation is and how, how everything is done so perfectly. Animals are awesome. And in the Bible, Jesus is compared to a lion. We just sang about it, huh? Because lions are majestic and glorious, and they reflect God's glory. What about a giraffe? It seems a little bit odd and different when you pay attention to these animals which seem so different from others. You notice how gorgeous they are the skin, the format, they're different. 
They're, they're beautiful. And, and unfortunately, many are endangered species now. They're, they're being uh, taken away from us. We ourselves are to blame. What about frogs? I love frogs. They're beautiful. I'm not afraid of them. I'm not afraid. I shouldn't be afraid of any animals. Why? Because they're all parts of God's creation. And you know what? God loves them all. And we should love them all as well. All of them. Because the person who loves God loves the things that God loves. And God loves all of his creation. All of it has a reason to be. It's a, a web of life and all is important. Each creature is equally important. And to be a Christian is to cherish God's creation too, among other things. So let's contemplate nature. Let us realize that it is a gift from God. What, a, what do you think of that? Who wants to speak about this? Noah. I see you were excited. Do you like nature? Yes? Great. I like it too, you know. And that's pleasant in the eyes of the Lord. So may, the, may God continue to bless us with sensitivity as we live, that we may live properly. And let us sing now. Children, uh, I don't know if some of them will go. Ginny isn't here with us today. She sent an email informing me that she couldn't be here, but she'll be here next Sunday. So let us pray. Father, thank you for your creatures, the animals, the plants, the flowers, the bugs, the stars, the planets. Thank you, Lord. What a wonderful, wonderful, awesome universe and world that you created and you gave to us and thank you for our children each one of them uh, a little flower a bud full of potential bless them keep them protect them and lead them lord we pray in christ jesus amen
You may be seated. We're going to read again from Scripture. I, I'll read it and I ask you to follow as I read the letter of the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome, the so-called Epistle to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 18 to 25. This is the very apogee of the letter, the climax of the letter, right at the middle of it. And this is what the sacred text says. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by his own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, we who are the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship. The redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we, have, if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Almighty God, Lord of creation, of which we are a part, Bless us now as we seek instruction and wisdom and nourishment, spiritual nourishment, bread of life. Inspire us now, we pray. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. I'm starting a new series today. It's a three-part series on stewardship. I call it a call to stewardship. It will last for three Sundays, which are the three Sundays before uh, my vacation. And part one is creation. We Christians are called to stewardship regarding creation. So, I call it CSI. CSI is Crime Scene Investigation. You might know this because of the many uh, TV series with that name. But our series on stewardship is also CSI because it's going to discuss in three parts stewardship to, of creation, stewardship of society. Sounds like a lot of responsibility, huh? And finally, stewardship stewardship of ourselves, of my individual self. We need to tend to ourselves, but we also need to tend to others around us and society in general. And first and foremost, we need to tend to creation and the world that God has made for us to live in. Creation is good. This is the first lesson. In the first chapter of the Bible, we read that God created the world and he said, and God saw that it was good. Not once, but many times. The same sentence repeats again and again. It was good. God created the plants and it was good. And he created the animals and it was good. And he saw it was good. 
good. And the planets and the moon and the sun. And it was good. And sometimes we forget how good it is. And we uh, seem to think that it is irrelevant or secondary. It is not. It is something very good in the eyes of God and humanity too. And we are also part of creation. We are also good. Creation is God's. Creation is not only good, creation is God's. It doesn't belong to us. And this is so important, isn't it? It is not ours for us to dispose of. It belongs to God. Each creature, each animal, each plant. You may kill them if you need to. If there's a good reason for it, do it without cruelty. If you need to eat, that's fine. But remember, it is something that belongs to God that is under your care that you're using because God loves it. God loves his creation and he loves each and every one of us. Each and every one of us. And we need to realize that this is what the Bible tells us. Creation is therefore godly because it belongs to God and as we read in the book of Psalms and it is also in Chronicles and in many other parts of the Bible all reveals God so it reflects and reveals God's own being and more than that as we read in the chapter that of the book of Isaiah that we selected it worships God and you say, oh, that's poetry. Yes, it is. It says that the, the trees clap to the Lord and the birds sing to the Lord. And you know, each and every creature, as it performs its duty, it worships the Lord. The duty of every creature is a form of worship, just as we are supposed to be our best possible selves. And that's worship. That's better worship to God than any song we may sing. I love music. I love to sing hymns to the Lord. But becoming the person that God wants me to be, that's much bigger worship to the Lord than anything I might say or sing. Because creation is godly and we are part of creation. And we must never forget that. Okay. Genesis 2.15, it says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. That was God's purpose in creation. He gave us a garden to cultivate it and to keep it. That's what the narrative tells us. And it has meaning to us today. There's a garden here in this earth and we need to cultivate it and keep it because we are the children of Adam in a sense. But now we are restored and redeemer in Christ. We are children of God in Christ. So now we can do it. That's why Paul says that creation expects the manifestation of the children of God. Genesis 1:28, it says that God told men and women created by him, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over it. Well, that's your translation in England, you know, but nowadays we know that that translation was based upon a certain thought paradigm. You know what I mean? A certain structural matrix that is beneath our thinking. And what I'm saying is that it is not a proper translation. That's not what God wants. Simply that we subdue and 
have dominion upon nature because we can destroy it and use it and exploit it as much as we can. It is for us to guard it. It is for us to be stewards of God's world. And that's the proper translation. Stewardship, not ownership. The Bible is very clear about it. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. All who live in it, not only human beings, but animals and plants who live in it, they belong to the Lord. So we need to have reverence for life. You know that expression? It's by Albert Schweitzer, the famous um, Nobel Prize winner, the man who lived a hundred years. Uh, he was a German theologian, philosopher, musician, missionary in Africa, one of the greatest men who ever lived. Albert Schweitzer wrote a book called Reverence for Life, a principle by which a Christian must live. Reverence for life. Because Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And that means that life is important, that life is sacred, and we need to have reverence for it. And in Leviticus, in the law of Moses, we already see God saying, the land is mine, and you are but aliens, and my tenants. Did you know that God called you an alien? <laughs> yes, he did. You were an aliens. You were my tenants. I'm the landlord, and you are my tenants. That's the word of the Lord. So, proper Christian stewardship over God's creation creation is incompatible with a worldview which is exploitative of nature and in an unsustainable way. You see, sustainability means co-inhabiting the planet with plants and animals in a way that everybody can be happy and things may proceed as they should. So, in a market society, it's easy, very easy to let it slip. And we make money more important than anything else. And then exploitation of nature can happen. We must be firm against that because it belongs to God. And we must have a different worldview it does not mean that, we, that it, making money is wrong. It is the love of money that is a problem and the root of all evil, according to Scripture. That's from Paul. The root of all evil. Not money, but the love of money. Money is good. Money is to be used for good things, to make things grow. There are policies and practices that threaten the health of the planet. Reliance on non-renewable resources. The destruction of ecological niches and habitats and pollution. Well, it sounds like a lecture on environmental concerns and, and, and policies. Well, let me say this is very much what we need to bring into our hearts. It's the word that is, uh, needs to be heard. It's God's will, which is good and perfect and pleasant. And it's his word to his church. Even though many churches are against this. Many churches are speaking against it. You know, Christian churches, they uh, think this is idolatry. It is worshiping nature. It is not. It is taking the Bible seriously. At least this is my opinion. If you do not agree, that's fine. Friendship will be the same. There's a false break, my friends. A false break in our thinking that separate people from nature. Humans and the rest of creation. But the Bible is clear 
in saying that we are part of creation and part of the restoration of creation, that the resurrection of Christ that we have celebrated last Sunday when we celebrated Easter. It's the celebration of life, of renewal, of reconciliation, of restoration, not only of humans and God, but the restoration of all of creation because this is what God has planned. This is what is in his mind. People stopped thinking of themselves as part of nature, but we are. We're made of the same kind of cells and the same atoms protons, neutrons, and electrons, and we need plants and animals and air and water, and we need, and they need us, and we need them, and we need to live in communion with nature to be happy and to be able to experience all the glory of God's creation. That different mindset with that false break made it easier for us humans to exploit nature in unsustainable ways. And we need to say no to that because nature has a certain sacramentality to it. You see, it's, this is spiritual. It is religious, if you like that word. It is religious, not about religious observance that is ritualistic, but our conception of the sacred. John Calvin, who was the founder of the Calvinist, the Reformed tradition of which we belong, he said in his writings that other than scripture, it is nature that reveals God to us. And you know why he said that? Because that's what the Bible says. And we became nevertheless desensitized. Nature for us is not anymore something that conveys God's being. And that's terrible. We stop to see the sacramental side of nature. We may think that baptism and the Lord's Supper are sacraments. Actually, many of us don't. We think it's just a a silly ritual, we should stop doing it. Actually, we should expand the notion of sacramentality to everything that looks sacred in our eyes. And nature, God's creation, has a sacramental side to it because it speaks of God to us. We are led we were led to desacramentalize and to instrumentalize nature to human ends and for profit. And we forgot. And, and people say, oh, you're bringing ideas from other religions. You see, even Jesus said that if his people stopped uh, worshiping the Lord, which, be, which is thinking and acting properly, even the stones would start to proclaim. So... All truth belongs to God. Doesn't matter where it appears. It may appear in the works of a, an atheist philosopher. It may, it may appear in the words of, of a religious leader of a different religion, a different faith community. It doesn't matter. You know why? Because I am the truth, Jesus Christ said. Truth belongs to God. Doesn't matter where it appears. This is what Abraham Kuyper, the famous uh, Dutch theologian, philosopher, politician, a Calvinist, important Calvinist of the 20th century, of the 19th to the 20th century, he said, this is what we call common grace. Common grace. There is special grace, but there is common grace that God has given to all. And there's wisdom, God's wisdom, everywhere. Like a, a shattered crystal that fell from heaven, and there are pieces of it in every tradition. 
Now, since I'm speaking a lot about reformed thinking, I want to present to you the CFR thought scheme, which I learned since my days in the seminary and that I love so much. Creation, fall, redemption. This is the CFR scheme. Creation, fall, redemption. It is so important to think in this way as we contemplate scripture and the things of God. It's a very reformed way of thinking. It was imagined and explored by Hermann Dooyeverd. He is a, a Dutch philosopher, a Calvinist philosopher of the 20th century. Very important. He created what we call reformational thought. Some people call it reformational philosophy. You see, he didn't say reformed because reformed seems to be something that is done. It's done and ready. But when you say reformational thought, it's a different thing. And that's what Calvinism, that's what Presbyterianism needs to be. Like the old famous saying of John Calvin himself, Ecclesia Reformata ac propter reformanda est, which means a reformed church needs to continue to be reforming. Reformation never ends. That's why Doyle had said, better than reformed theology or reformed churches, we should be reformational churches and adopt a reformational theology, which implies dynamics. And he said, creation, fallen redemption is a scheme which is inherent in Scripture and intrinsic to Scripture. So to think biblically means to think in terms of creation, fallen redemption. And when we think about ourselves and about nature and about history, we need to think in this way. What does it mean? What difference does it make? Well, it means that God is not only the creator who gave us a creation, but also a world that is a fallen world. It is subject to sin. And that means that it is not all good because sin brought evil into the world. And it means that nature is subject to decay. It's what scientists who acknowledge this, they call it the entropic principle. What is the entropic principle? It is the inclination to decay that is present in nature. Everything in time decays, like our bodies. I know you're very conscious of that. I am more and more conscious of it every week. Uh, our, body are the, our bodies are decaying. Like Martin Heidegger said, humans are beings walking toward death. It's not like it's something that is going to happen in the future. Sorry, folks. It is happening right now. It is happening right now to you and to me. We are dying. Our bodies are decaying. And that's because of sin. We live in a fallen world. And that's part of the deal. C-F-R. That's the F. Creation itself will be liberated, though, and that's the promise. From its bondage to decay, that's the Bible, okay? The bondage to decay, the entropic principle, entropy, things decay. And brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We're not being redeemed alone. In Christ, all of God's creation is being redeemed and brought into incorruptibility. That's the promise. Sounds too much, but that's the promise. That's the hope, our blessed hope. The redemption of all of creation. And that's what is in God's mind. It is a perfect sandwich. I'm always looking for the perfect sandwich. If you know a place, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> but this is a theoretical sandwich, okay? It's an abstraction. So. Fallenness in this sandwich is the meat. 
We have the meat. We have, we have the sinfulness in us. But it is encircled. It is completely enfolded into, in, in the midst of two glorious thoughts, glorious realities. One is creation in God's image, and the second one is redemption in Christ for glory. So, you see why sin is less important than many Christians think? Because sin is real, but it is under control because it's encircled, enfolded, encapsulated in between two glorious truths. Creation, when we understand what the, world me what the word means, and redemption. So we talked about creation and we talked about the fall, C-F-R. Let's talk about redemption now. Redemption in Christ, which is an expression that Paul uses again and again and again in his letters, many, many times, in Christ, we are redeemed. It's like a, a locus, it's like a place where you stand, it's a location. A theoretical place where you can stand and be safe in Christ. It means in communion in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, the entropic, the entropic principle, decay, corruptibility. So in Christ all will be made alive. You see, we are the first fruits of something enormous, humongous, a new creation, a new heaven, a new earth. That's what, the, that's what the New Testament is all about. The children of God, that creation waits in eager expectation to be revealed. The children of God. You know who are the children of God? You and me. In the fullness of the Holy Spirit. When we are in Christ and in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, we can properly be the children of God who are not yet incorruptible, but who know that this is where we're going. Into full glory and full redemption. And therefore, in the Spirit, in Christ, in communion with God, with God creator, we are able to embrace our duties before God. And one of them is stewardship. Stewardship towards creation. Stewardship towards society. Stewardship towards ourselves as well. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Why the metaphor of childbirth? Why, Paul says, childbirth? Because it's a new beginning. Christ is a new beginning. It's a new reality which is being born. Oh, but that was 2,000 years ago. 2,000 is nothing in the eyes of God. Actually, we are living a very crucial moment in history, in the history of salvation. Now, God is speaking again to his people as he has spoken before. And he's raising his prophets to speak to the people and call them into action so that we can save the world. Oh, pastor, are you crazy? We cannot save the world. We cannot save nature. We cannot save the whales, save the elephants. We cannot even shave the elephants. We cannot save the, the elephants. Yes, we can. Sorry, this is not a political statement. It is the truth. We can help. We cannot do it each one by, by himself, herself, but we can do it together. And that's our duty. More important than our accomplishments, it's to fulfill our duties before God and be faithful. God, Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, what matters to God is to find 
his ministers, and you are also a servant of God, a minister of God, find his servants faithful. His stewards, that's the word that Paul uses. I just reminded, he remember, remembered. He says, what God expects of his stewards is that they are found faithful. Accomplishments will come naturally if we are faithful. Now, to conclude, this is a call to stewardship. It's a call for us to understand the importance of caring for creation. And that's a call to the church that God is doing now. And many churches are awakening to this important uh, notion. And we can do it. We can do it as a church. We are seeking. We are doing a lot of soul searching here at West Flamborough Presbyterian Church. Did you know that? There are teams getting groups, getting together, thinking, what is our future? What is our mission? I know you have done it before many times. And you have already produced excellent work, but we're still doing it. We're still trying to find our new identity. This is a new beginning after all. And we have heard many of you telling me that this is one emphasis that we should have because God, the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to us and is telling us be the ones who care for creation. Be the ones who teach the stewardship of creation. And become an example. Because it's just a small thing. A small seed. But it may produce a lot. A hundredfold. So it is a mission. And it is a vocation. Let's consider it. All I'm asking is for you to ponder upon this. Is this something that can be part of our vocation as a local church? That we think globally, but act locally for God in the stewardship of creation? Teaching it, giving the example, acting upon this idea? Think about it. Bring it into your heart, into your prayers, and think about it. And God bless you. We'll proceed singing praises of the Lord, well selected by my partner in crime, our dear Rachel Solvik. Um, we'll sing again the praises of the Lord. <clears throat>
You may be seated. There are many ways in which we serve the Lord. One of them is by maintaining this ministry. And you can offer and bring your tithes and, and gifts to the church in many different ways. One of them is uh, putting some money on the plates. But now we do this by acknowledging a way of acknowledging your contributions, your faithfulness, and your generosity. And we praise the Lord and thank you for it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the offerings. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us that we may proceed in this ministry and in this service. I ask your blessing upon this church that you give us what we need to serve you properly. Bless each and every member of this congregation. And thank you, Lord, for giving all of us very comfortable lives and the comfort and the strength and the peace of mind to face adversity. I ask, Lord, that you continue to bless us that way, both materially and spiritually. Thank you, Lord. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We, are, we want also to remind you to pray for those who are sick, our shut-ins, people who are battling cancer. We already mentioned Gil Stewart and his family, his wife Brenda, but there are others in our church, as you know, who are battling cancer. We remember Margaret. I believe he, she isn't here with us now. She has to go through a procedure. She's doing well and they need our help, and we are helping them. 
The church is organizing to help uh, her and Water and John as they struggle. And also Charlene, also Ruth, and many others we know. And let us continue to pray for one another. Father in heaven, we pray, Lord, for those who are battling illnesses of all kinds. Have mercy on them, Lord, and bless them as they continue to walk in the wilderness, ready to cross over to the process, to the promised land. As we all approach River Jordan, give us, Lord, the strength, the spiritual strength that we need, and be with us. Hold our hands, Lord. And hold the hands of those who are suffering for different reasons. We particularly pray for those who are in prison. Those who are in the midst of war. Those who hunger all over the world. There are new problems, new political uncertainties and insecurities. Have mercy, Lord, on all. We pray, Lord, for those who defend your cause and also those who are struggling and fighting for ways of living which are, in, which are sustainable and in harmony with the maintenance of your world and creation of which we also benefit. Have mercy on us, Lord, and show us and give us the, the glimpse of the future, the glorious future that you have for us, and give us the optimism of hope. In Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. I forgot to pray for my wife, Lilia. Indeed, she told me not to mention that she is sick, but I ask your prayers for her. It's good for you to know why she's in here, uh, so that's why I mentioned. And now, receive the benediction. We live in a fallen world, a world in which we are every day menaced by temptation menaced by false thinking and fake news and wrong ideas and people who try to take us into the wrong path while we try to keep ourselves in the less traveled road, which is the way, the way of Christ. And this is why I tell you this now. This is why now I give you these words. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the mercies and the compassion of God in Christ, may the love of God, which is unfailing, infinite and eternal, may God the Holy Spirit and the communion that he gives us with God and with one another be with you acting upon you powerfully today and tomorrow and forever. Amen. We'll sing again and conclude this service of worship with the last, straw, last verses of, of the beautiful hymn that we were singing. <laughs>